And so we're going to open the conference with um, Professor David Carroll. He's a uh, um, represent for the whole like MIT undergraduate like um, I, like electronics and computer science department. So please welcome Professor Carroll. Thank you. On uh, behalf of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to Cambridge and to MIT. Um, just for those who have traveled, I'd especially like to offer a welcome. Uh, Boston's often referred, and Greater Boston is often referred to as the hub, and it's certainly a hub of engineering and education and innovation. Uh, there's 15 different universities with electrical engineering programs uh, in the Boston area. Uh, there's also many large technology companies ranging from homegrown companies like Raytheon and Analog Devices to uh, the facilities of most of the major international corporations. For, for example, uh, a block away we have 800 people with Google and a tremendous range of other companies that have been attracted to this area. Uh, moreover, the Boston and Cambridge area is really a center of entrepreneurship and venture capital. There's over 4,000 technology-related startups in Massachusetts, and in fact, in this year, just this year so far alone, there's about almost $900 million invested in uh, over 91 deals uh, for New England tech companies. So you've really, for those of you who traveled, you've really come to one of the, the true uh, centers of engineering and innovation in the country. I'd also like you to, to welcome you to MIT and to Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. Uh, for those of you who are at home here, I'll give you a little bit of background. It's the largest single department at MIT. It's almost 130 faculty and we issue well over 300 undergraduate and 300 to graduate degrees each year in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And like many of the people coming to this conference, uh, there's a great interest in research among undergraduates here. So more than 90% of EECS undergraduates participate in formal research through the MIT Undergraduate Research Opportunities, or EUROP program, and, that, and some of those it's for a semester, and many we've also now have a super EUROP program, which is year-long uh, intensive research usually carried out by juniors or seniors. And so we have more than 25% of our uh, departmental students are involved in uh, research in any given term. Moreover, if you consider the MIT undergraduate population, what you'll find is there's actually much more unofficial R&D carried out in dorms and workshops and labs across campus. So I think uh, for those of you traveling, uh, I think you'll feel quite at home here because it's, it, it's very much a like-minded group of people uh, as our <coughs> undergraduate population. Perhaps I'll just tell you a little bit more about uh, EECS and MIT. Uh, in addition to the department itself, we have uh, four affiliated research labs. The first is the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, which is in fact housed in the beautiful uh, Stata Center in which you're now sitting. And that covers artificial intelligence, systems, uh, computer science theory, robotics. We also have the Lab for Information and Decision Systems that covers systems and controls, communications and networks, inference and statistical data processing. We have the Microtechnologies Re uh, Research Laboratories, which covers uh, semiconductor devices and fabrication, integrated circuits, optics, and uh, systems based on those. And lastly, we have the Research Laboratory for Electronics, uh, that covers engineering physics, say atomic physics, quantum systems, also my own area of energy, power, and electromagnetics, also photonic devices and systems and nanosystems, and finally biomedical. Now in addition to the labs, there's also many interdepartmental uh, institutes, and two of those that uh, are well related to EECS and to these labs are the Institute for Medical Engineering and Sciences, which really uh, focuses on medical devices and systems, and the Institute for Data Systems and Society, or IDSS, which really focuses on information processing and, uh, and relation to social and technical systems. So, first of all, welcome to this area. I think uh, one of the things I'd like to note is that the 
areas in which EECS and our affiliated labs are engaged are very much strongly aligned with the conference themes, energy, renewables, and sustainability, humanity and social development, <coughs> communication and connectivity, and computer and information technology. So I think there's a very strong alignment, and I think the themes really reflect the key directions towards the future of engineering technology in our society. So first of all, I congratulate you on working in the areas that I uh, think are quite important for the future of our community. I'd like to make uh, one final remark, uh, especially since this is groups focused on undergraduates. Um, I think today is an exciting time to be pursuing electrical engineering and computer science. In fact, perhaps the most exciting time in history for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, the technical opportunities are tremendous. Uh, the pace of technological development is extremely rapid, perhaps more rapid than any time in history. And in fact, it seems to continue to be accelerating. And all this development really opens up tremendous opportunities for skilled engineers and researchers to push the boundaries of technology. Secondly, the tools to accomplish extraordinary research have both become powerful and readily available to the individual. So simulation tools, design tools, means of fabrication of systems are all very much less expensive and very much more available to the individual. So something that in years past would have required many years of a large team of engineers, perhaps in a major corporation with lots of capital equipment, are really now accessible to individuals or very small groups of people working very quickly. And I think this is democratizing the engineering process and so that individuals in engineering can have more impact than ever. Lastly, I think the barriers have been lowered to information and communication. So both sharing uh, your ideas and going out and gathering and finding out what else is going on in the world that's been easier than ever, in part through uh, things like IEEE Explorer, which most students here should have direct access to. Also, there's a much greater ease with the availability of communications of making connections and raising funding to explore ideas, everything from Kickstarter to interactions more uh, nationally and globally uh, towards those who, who need ideas and can provide resources for those ideas. So I think uh, by all those measures, it's really an exciting time to be heading into the engineering community. And I, for one, am really excited and looking forward to what the next 20 years is going to bring. And I think that's largely uh, the province of people that are in this audience to make those things happen. So in conclusion, I think uh, the, the Undergraduate Research Conference uh, here this weekend is really a, an excellent opportunity to both uh, share and gather ideas and make those connections and go out there and do things. So I wish you a very productive and exciting weekend. And again, welcome to uh, Cambridge, MIT, and to the Undergraduate Research Conference. Good morning. I'm Sun Wan. Hope you guys will know me by now. If not, we have two days to, 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 uh, to know each other. Uh, I'm the conference program chair. But uh, most, of, most of the work is actually done by the student, by the uh, MIT uh, IEEE student branch. So they actually uh, structure the whole programs, uh, invite all the speakers. But the next uh, keynote speaker is actually I invited. When I invited him a few months ago, he straight away a response saying yes, because Boston is his favorite city. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now, uh, he, he is the uh, IEEE uh, next year, 2016 IEEE uh, president and the CEO. So it is an honor and privilege to have him to uh, open up this uh, conference today. So for the next two days conference, please uh, meet friends, uh, talk to uh, us, talk to uh, the speakers, right? We get to know more about uh, what we're doing and uh, what you can do in the future. Barry? Thanks, Sue, and, and, uh, and good morning. And, and he's, he's absolutely right. Boston is my favorite city in the entire world, and I've traveled the world quite a bit um, for many of the reasons discussed earlier in terms of being a, a hot spot for technology. But it's, it's just a great city with all the universities. It's not just the technology, but it's the culture, uh, it's the social activities that go on. It's a large city without feeling like a large city. So, um, 
I use any excuse at all to come back to MIT and come back to, uh, to Boston, so soon thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. So I'm gonna talk, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about leadership today at a technology conference, and, and hopefully I can, uh, I can tie together some, uh, some threads and some strings here for you uh, to get you to think a little bit about leadership. I know it's early in your career as undergraduates, and fundamentally you wanna say, you know, what I wanna do is I wanna do these really cool things. I wanna get in the lab, I wanna build things, I wanna design things. Um, but fundamentally, what you need to think about is working in teams. At some point, you are going to end up being a leader. You have to be. Um, early in your career, you may be small teams. As you progress in your career, uh, become a little bit more senior. If you're working in a startup or if you're working in a corporation, you will find yourself in positions leading other people in technology and technology development. And what I'm going to try to do today is talk to you a little bit about that. I, uh, <clears throat> I certainly have a deep technical background. Um, I, I didn't graduate from this August uh, institution. I graduated from the one on the opposite end of the uh, of the spectrum out of Stanford. Um, so I spent quite a, many, uh, quite a few years dealing with technology. My background is electromagnetic uh, waves and fields as well as photonics. Um, but over the years, you see I'm, I'm the professor and head of electrical engineering and computer science at West Point. Um, I, I have spent a good many years thinking about teaching and dealing with leadership. And so I hope to bring uh, some of those uh, skills and those activities to bear today. So the agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about some foundations of leadership, very little bit. And then I'm going to provide you with a little bit of a environmental scan in terms of the environment that you all are going to see in probably the next five to ten years, what that looks like. And then we're going to progress on and, and talk a little bit about what current CEOs are saying about the needs of of engineers, of technologists, as well as leaders now and into the future. So let's, uh, let's begin. I, I give a, uh, I've given quite a number of uh, one hour, two hour, three hour workshops on leadership. Um, I'm not going to do that today, so it's a much compressed, and, and I'm not going to talk about the foundations of le leadership so much. I'm going to point you in a direction where you can get some additional information about this, but what I would say fundamentally is when you think about leadership, it's like any other course, it's like any other topic, you have to spend some time thinking about the process and how you become a leader. Uh, there's, there's lots and lots of books out there on leadership. Uh, some folks will tell you that leaders are born. Um, probably 99% of people will tell you that leaders are not born, but leaders are created. Um, and, and they are created in a very deliberative kind of a, a process. And the process that we use at West Point and the process that I've used in these workshops looks something like this. It's a, it's a closed loop system, we'll use it controls kind of an analogy. It is a closed loop system in which you begin by acquiring new knowledge. And you acquire that new knowledge by going to uh, seminars like this one. You acquire the new knowledge by picking up books or magazines or articles and reading about what leaders are about and how leaders actually lead. Um, and you actually get involved in that. The second part of it is experiential. And, and experience is very important. So you can, it's just like anything else. You can go to a, an electrical engineering course and you can uh, do the theory, but if you don't get into the lab and apply it, you don't really see what comes to fruition. And so experiencing leadership is particularly important. And, and leadership experience starts with things like running a conference like this, trying to proverbially herd all of the cats, uh, getting the conference to start at eight o'clock and then eight o'clock was too early for some, and then 8.30 and then maybe a little bit after 8.30 once they get coffee and we get rolling along. Uh, but there are lots and lots of leadership opportunities. Uh, stepping forward and being a leader in a small team, in a design group, in a design team, um, as well as these kinds of conferences, the Boston section, uh, IEEE leadership at the local section, the student branch section, getting that kind of experience. And then the third part of it that's really important in this process is reflection. And reflection is fundamentally about uh, you, you know that there's a theory for leadership, what you should be doing. You go out and you apply it in some form. And then you step back and you say, did that work? 
And if it worked, good. You kind of file it away. If it didn't work, you think about what you need to do in order to make it better. And in this process is a spiral kind of a process that goes throughout your entire career. I do this on a regular basis with meetings. You know, we hold a meeting. Uh, there are some leadership found, uh, fundamentals about holding a meeting and about running an effective meeting so that you don't waste people's time. Um, and at the end of the meeting, I will sit back. Uh, if I'm the chair of the, the meeting, I may have a secretary, I may have somebody else, and we will sit back and we will say, okay, how did the meeting go? Did we accomplish what we wanted to accomplish? Did we waste people's time? Did, was everybody in the meeting engaged? And then from that, we then improve on the next uh, part of it. So, so these are some of the foundations of leadership, and, and I'm going to stop there on the foundations and point you to, I've, I've written a, uh, an, an e-book on leadership that's in IEEE USA's portfolio. There's some other IEEE um, uh, resources on leadership, and you can go here and you can get some additional information about how to run effective meetings, what leadership is about, and some additional references uh, if you're particularly interested in that. So let me now change a little bit and talk about the world we're in and the world that we're going to be in in the future. And what I would say is this, is, this comes from an environmental scan from IEEE. So IEEE, largest technical professional society in the world. We have about 430,000 members worldwide in about 160 countries. I can go on and on and on about all the, uh, the data on that. That's what I'm supposed to do as the president of IEEE. I'm supposed to tell people about that. But what IEEE does is, is routinely um, does an environmental scan. What's going on in the, in the external environment so that we know how to position our professional society to support the members and the contributors in our particular professions. So the next couple of slides are going to deal a little bit with the world that we are in and the world that we are going to see in about the next 10 years. Some of this may not seem particularly relevant to undergraduates dealing with EE or CS. You're trying to get through signals and systems or electromagnetic fields and waves. As a course, you're trying to study this, you're trying to design things. But in the greater context of what those technologies are being used for and where they're being applied, it becomes particularly important. Large corporations want to know things like the demographics, what's going on in the world. Uh, you see here that the world population by 2030 is projected to reach about 8.4 billion people. What does that mean? You start thinking about the, the second and third order consequences of that number of people. You think about energy, you think about food, you think about all of the other kinds of things that we worry about as a society. Increasing mobility and changing migration patterns. This is fundamentally the demographics, but you will see in a couple of minutes, technology professionals are part of this. And so, in, a, you know, in past years, there was an era where you became an engineer at Lockheed Martin or at General Electric and you stayed there for your entire career. That is certainly not the case now, and that's going to be less and less of the case in the future. The idea of, of people, more people living in urban areas, um, if you're at all familiar with IEEE and megacities, the kinds of things that we're worried about, uh, you see that uh, by 2030 there's a projection that there will be 41 megacities with over 66% of the world population living in those cities. The question is, is what kind of issues does that bring to bear for you in the future as electrical engineers, computer scientists, as technical professionals? The global economy, there's a definite shift in economic power to the east and to the south. The uh, emerging economies, that in 2001 there was a, a focus, if you uh, spend any time at all talking about um, business and about investment strategies, there was this term called BRIC, it was a BRIC strategy, which was Brazil, Russia, India, and China, those were the big countries that uh, many corporations were looking at. Those demographics, because of the demographic shift and because of the global economy shift, those are in fact changing and the global demand for energy and electricity is increasing dramatically. Um, I'll talk a little bit about cyber in a couple of minutes, but that uh, plays too. Uh, science and technology provides a path to global competitiveness. When you think about this, you think about economic growth, and I highlighted the kinds of things that positive economic growth are going to be needing. 
and they are things like talent, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the future, what, what you all should be thinking about in terms of your education and what kinds of things you should be thinking about for the future, but certainly things like innovation and entrepreneurship are, are being integrated within curriculums here at MIT and elsewhere. And then in terms of government policies, things like increased uh, regulation and compliance and government scrutiny. I come from the government, so I know all about government scrutiny. Uh, social and consumer, the global middle class will grow much larger than it is today, about, about half or greater than half of that 8 billion uh, population that we talked about a little bit earlier. There is a rise of what's being called Generation C, my generation, which is a much older generation than most of the, uh, in the audience here. But Generation C is all about being connected, it's about communicating, it's about being content-centric, computerized, community-oriented, and clicking and change. Okay, that is the current generation. You're completely connected. You, know, you always know who's doing what to whom and where you are and where your friends are. And then finally, there's, there's uh, tailored consumer content. Um, I took off, I thought it was a little bit derogatory. The, the, the title was, It's All About Me. Um, I didn't want to didn't want to offend anybody, but fundamentally that's what it's about. And when, when you think about IEEE, you think about focusing uh, on individual needs for products and service. You don't necessarily want to do a search of all of the IEEE database. You want to know what you need to know right now to help you with what you're do dealing with. And then there's this <clears throat> concept of the inform information explosion and access. Digital universe continues to grow. Um, by 2030, better than half of the world population will have internet access. That is going to fundamentally change how we go about sharing information and how we engage. And then, as I said, this, this concept of cyber is incredibly important. You can pick up the New York Times or your favorite local newspaper on a regular basis and find technology problems and technology uh, issues affecting national policy, social, and political uh, events. In terms of science and technology trends, MIT actually coined this the third revolution uh, a couple of years ago, and this is the convergence of life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. So the area of biomedical engineering, robotics, all of those kinds of things, we are seeing a convergence that is really expanding our disciplines and our field. And many of you are taking courses that are non-traditional kinds of electrical engineering courses or computer science courses outside in these basic science, fundamental science, biology, and those other kinds of uh, areas. And you can see that R&D spending growth uh, continues to accelerate. So what is it that tomorrow's leaders should look like? So that gives you a, a context of of the current environment and what the future environment is going to be, be like. So the question is, is what kind of attributes and what kind of skills do you need as leaders, technology leaders, for the future? So there is a, I, I would argue that there is a changed relationship between technology and humankind, or the human dimension of technology. Uh, as, I, as I said previously, it was things like geopolitical issues, economic issues, social issues that were impacting, they were what the drivers were. Today, we are seeing much more impact from technology. Technology is actually impacting and driving society, social, political, economic kinds of issues. As I said, just think about, pick up the, pick up the newspaper and think about the cyber attacks that occurred that caused geopolitical implications between many countries around the world. Those were technological issues that brought to bear impact on the human dimension of what we're dealing with. So there's a, there's a, very, a very rich relationship between technology and the human dimension. Complex problems, uh, you heard about dealing worldwide with uh, engineering solutions and engineering problem sets. Um, that will continue and it's going, to, it's going to grow in terms of interdisciplinary nature of things. So it's no longer an electrical engineer sitting down and designing things. It is really a team 
that brings to bear many, many different disciplines working on a particular problem or, or a solution. We talked about the, global, uh, the growing mobile workforce and that workforce, how it's transiting across the world, and collaboration is the key to success in terms of what uh, we will be doing in the future. Engineering with a conscience, we are already um, working in this space and this is going to become even more important as we move forward in the future. Um, things like green energy, uh, things like uh, green computing, high performance computing, all of those kinds of things are going to continue to remain very, very important and, and are going to be required to be integrated into the projects and the solutions that we are in fact working on. So let's talk a little bit about this, this concept of a, of a T-shaped individual. So a T-shaped individual is someone who has very deep, if you will, technical skills in maybe electrical engineering or computer science or some specific discipline. But, but there is a growing need uh, spoken about by CEOs. Um, a growing need to have those engineers have other kinds of skills and other kinds of capabilities. Communication skills have been and will continue to be very important. Being able to stand up in front of a group and speak. Uh, so oral communication, but just as important is written communications. Um, you know, the, the interrelationship between people. Being able to serve on an interdisciplinary team and understand how people operate, how people function, and how you can get the, the most out of those individuals as you possibly can. Um, the social, the economic, the political dimensions. You're going to see in the next slide or so, it's going to be incumbent on you as technologists, not just to know the fundamental technology, but to understand what's going on politically and globally, so that you can bring to bear solutions that fit into the context of that larger uh, ecosystem, if you will. And so there are many schools are looking at this. If you think about ABET accreditation for engineering and computing, uh, they want um, diverse people, people with skills across the spectrum and not just very, very deep, deep technical skills. <clears throat> Lifelong learning is something else that is absolutely necessary and is expected. Uh, many CEOs, you are going to graduate from whatever institution you're at, um, and that is only the beginning. That is going to provide you the foundations, you're going to get out and you are going to see problems uh, and challenges that you've never seen in the classroom or in the research lab before. And you're going to have to pick up some books, you're going to have to go to a seminar, um, perhaps go online and figure out a new set of parameters or a new set of tools uh, that are going to help you to, uh, to solve the particular problems that you're dealing with. <clears throat> And this mobility across the globe um, is going to be your classroom. So you're not going to probably spend your entire life in Boston as much as you would like to, uh, but you're going to transit around the world into a wide variety of different cultures and, and work environments, and that is going to add to your educational portfolio as well, understanding more about kind of the human dimension. Anticipating outside issues. This again comes from the, uh, the Price, Water, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper uh, survey of CEOs where they want their technical folks in these large technical corporations to understand more about the global environment around them and what the impact of the designs, the technology that you are developing, how that fits into uh, the particular uh, social, political, economic uh, issues that you're dealing with. Mastering the soft art of leadership. This, I didn't put this in, this came out of the, the Price, Water, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper survey of CEOs. They expect technology uh, developers to also be leaders and to be able to step into a team, to operate within that team, to lead that team at some point in time um, and understand the things that you need to do to be able to motivate people, to inspire people, to get people to work together, uh, to get people to argue about the technology issues to a solution um, without destroying the team. That's what is expected in terms of 
the CEOs that are out there. And what I would say finally is, you know, in terms of leadership, don't ever forget what you learned in kindergarten, because those are also foundational and immutable kinds of, uh, of things. You know, sharing, you need to be able to build trust. There's a little different context. In kindergarten, you were probably taught a little bit differently. You know, the idea of don't, running with, don't run with scissors, that had a very definitive context when you were in kindergarten. In this case, when you get a little bit older, you get a little bit more wiser, a little bit more senior, it's more about risk management. If you told a kindergartner you need to assess risk management, they probably would have no concept of what you were talking about. So, so scissors made, made an impact then. But risk management, um, you know, as a leader, you know, be willing to say that you were wrong in a particular thing, particular issue, stepping up to it. Buddy system is all about teamwork and taking that. This goes now for you all who are working on your degrees as undergraduates. Okay, sleep deprivation is something that you have to pay particular attention to. Uh, it's probably why many people didn't want to start at eight o'clock this morning, um, but that's, uh, so, so you function a little bit better when you take a nap or when you are not sleep deprived. So, uh, so these, are, these are some foundational kinds of issues. So let me talk a little bit about IEEE. That's, uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, the IEEE mission is shown here, foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. That's what we are all about, driving forward in the profession. You see the vision there. Uh, we want to be essential to this global community of technical professionals uh, across this very broad spectrum of te technology professionals and the fields of interest that we deal with. Um, as I said, we have a very large impact. We are the largest technical professional society in the world with over 400, now it's about 430,000 members in over 160 countries. You see the number of technical societies and councils that we have. We have over 1,600, I guess maybe now 1,601 with this one, um, conferences annually across the technical breadth of our uh, disciplinary reach. We have uh, many, many, many technical documents. I'm sure uh, many of you have read many of the journals, the archive journals that we have, uh, and we have some of the best, highest rated um, periodicals in the world. Um, we spend a lot of time dealing with collaboration, and we collaborate in a couple of different uh, ways. We have 334 local geographic sections, the Boston section being one of them. Uh, we also have over 2,500 student branches, the IEEE ACM, uh, student branch, the joint student branch here at MIT is, is one of those. They provide a, a local geographic opportunity for people to get together to collaborate on a whole wide range of topics. And then we also have technical chapters that are very deeply focused on technology areas and have many of those, uh, the chapters here in the Boston section as well as at MIT focusing on communications, focusing on power and electronics or power and energy, other kinds of things. Um, so there, there are geographic as well as technical uh, opportunities for collaboration. And as you saw earlier, collaboration is what our business and our profession and our discipline really is all about. And this local area, again, one of the reasons I love coming to Boston is a, an incredibly rich heritage for IEEE, let alone everything else. The Boston section you see was founded in 1903. Um, it was the 12th branch, 12th branch of, of one of the predecessors that joined, that merged to become the, uh, the IEEE. Over 8,500 members in the local <coughs> Boston section with a whole host of activities uh, going on on a regular basis. A very vibrant, a very dynamic local section doing some great things. And then you see the MIT IEEE ACM club here. Uh, that's hosting this particular conference with the number of people uh, and some really unique kinds of, of activities that are going on here at the local section. Um, so with that, I am going to say thank you again for the opportunity to come uh, back to Boston. I, I never pass up an opportunity. If you do this again next year, I'm sure I will find time in my schedule to come back to Boston. Um, and let me just leave you with, uh, I, I've been asked to plug this particular activity which is going to occur at the end of the day today. So what you are going to see, 
throughout the day today is more of a traditional conference where people get together, there's a, a speaker standing up front talking about some technical aspect or some technical paper or it's a poster presentation of some kind. That is a very traditional kind of a, uh, of a conference. One of the things that IEEE is looking for is, is what do these engagements look like in the future? Will we continue to need to get together as a, as a body locally? I mean, think about who you interact with around the world. Think about who you know you deal with with on Facebook and LinkedIn and whatever your favorite. You know, I mean, I've got friends in Africa. I've got friends across the world that I remain in contact with, and it's very easy to set up a collaboration. So the question is: is what does a collaboration and engagement look like in the year 2020 or in the year 2030? And fundamentally, what does a conference look like in the year 2020 or 2030? And so there's some experimentation going on. Uh, this is one of them. This session this afternoon called Hack the Conference is an attempt to try something a little bit different in terms of a conference. And so I would encourage you to experience today and then go to this, this, this afternoon and see uh, what that experience might be like and, and give us some feedback so that we can in fact improve uh, because that's what we're all about. We're, we're all about as a professional society trying to remain relevant to those who are members and those who would be members. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. So we have our next speaker uh, lined up. We have a professor, um, Mildred, and she's going to talk about, um, she's an IEEE Medal of Honor, and she's going to give a next speech right now. Please welcome, please welcome Professor Mildred. I didn't bring any slides because I was kind of told not to bring slides, but just to talk to the students, thinking that there would be many, many students and not too many old folks here. <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, I just got back um, yesterday uh, from the University of Pennsylvania where I, I did sort of a kind of similar thing. It was much more university-wide, and it wasn't uh, particularly um, uh, aimed at uh, undergraduates. That's what I was told I was supposed to speak to today. Uh, and um, I was uh, told to speak about my contributions to the field and to leadership, and mostly how I got to where I was. That was the uh, main uh, a gist. Uh, of that because most of you are, I thought, going to be undergraduates thinking about how you got here. You said, title is two, 2015 IEEE, IEEE uh, MIT Undergraduate Research Technology Conference. And we have lots of different people here. Uh, that was from the announcement uh, kind of not what I expected, but that's just fine. And uh, I'll stop early enough that all of you who are here that have questions can uh, pose your particular thing. Uh, but I was going to uh, talk to uh, you about uh, how I got to where I am. I'm a very unlikely person to be here. Uh, and I've been a member of uh, IEEE since uh, the early 1970s which is maybe one of the longest memberships of the people present here. And I, I'll tell you how, how I got to join, too. Um, uh, okay, um, I, I start out um, my, uh, how I got to high, uh, junior high school and, and, and um, uh, to high school, that was the main, the main thing. Um, uh, I didn't grow up in Boston. I wasn't in, in Boston in my early years. Uh, uh, I grew up in New York City, and um, I uh, thought I was going to be a school teacher. That was what I planned. That was very uh, high-reaching, uh, because when I was uh, a young <coughs> student, I, the only people that I knew that went to college, even, were uh, 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 the doctor, if, if I ever got sick. I wasn't very often. And uh, also uh, um, uh, the school teachers, because they had uh, 
certification for, for teaching. And they influenced my life very much. So I thought that being a teacher would be a really great profession for me. And I'm, uh, I've really spent my career being a teacher, but not at the uh, elementary school level, which is what my original plan was. Um, I would say that the break in my career uh, came about when I, I saw an ad uh, about uh, uh, high school. I didn't know anything about high school. I was planning to go to the neighborhood high school. But there was one very special high school in New York City for girls. And uh, at that time, if you wanted to have a career, uh, you went to a girls' school and boys went to a boys' school. And but we had uh, several different uh, special high schools that if you got into those, you actually learned something. In the local schools, it was mostly discipline. And I was really tired of discipline and thought that I'd like to learn something. Uh, so I made an application uh, to get into um, Hunter High, and believe it or not, I was accepted. I was the first student, and to my knowledge, there weren't any others ever after me uh, from that particular uh, elementary school. And uh, so that, that's really strange because the talent, I'm sure, is universal and spread everywhere, but if you're not exposed to it, uh, then uh, you don't know about it, you never get there. Uh, well, I imagine everybody in this audience heard about something other was in the, in the audience. So this isn't really an appropriate topic, but uh, uh, arriving and being a person at the very bottom of the heap, I remember the first semester in, at Hunter High School, uh, when my papers came out back to me, they were negative grades. I don't know how many of you have ever had a negative grade on an examination. <laughs> they take off so many points for what you don't know, and uh, if you don't even know enough to get to zero, that's not too good. Uh, but uh, uh, it isn't very long before you, if you belong there, that you overcome that, that point. And so uh, the idea was to uh, not be negative, but always be positive. And um, I, I have a very positive feeling about life that one goes on and does, does things. And I'll tell you the many things that I did in my career, uh, uh, which was enabled by combining uh, uh, my engineering background plus my other interests. So as I said, said I was uh, brought into the, um, uh, learning by wanting to learn something, but I didn't know what. Uh, so uh, college was at Hunter College to be a school teacher. That, that continued uh, because I could understand that. And um, I had what's called a $5 education. Never in my life did I, I pay more than $5 a semester for anything because I didn't have more money, so I couldn't pay more money. And it was amazing that society allowed me to go on in the United States, this is possible. And I, I'm very thankful for this and um, have done something at all stages of my life to show uh, appreciation uh, for helping me get to this level, to that level, and so forth. So that was really quite wonderful. So uh, Hunter College, I met a very important individual in my life, and that was another lady who couldn't find a job. And uh, so she came to the Hunter College because she had gone to Hunter College. We know about her later. It's Rosalind Yellow, whom I'm talking about. Uh, she got the Nobel Prize later for uh, starting the whole field of medical uh, physics. And uh, uh, her big contribution to the Nobel Prize was radio immunoassay. Uh, and that was a combination of physics, chemistry, lots and lots of other things to the medical world. And then she went off into the medical world. But I had her at the time that she was still in physics before she went off into the medical world. 
and uh, she was my um, advisor, so to speak. I used to see her once in a while, and when she saw that I was giving a talk somewhere, all of a sudden she would pop up in the audience. Uh, well, she passed on in the 1990s, but uh, she was 10 years younger than me, and uh, uh, she had a very, very interesting career and did a great deal for society, and so she was a role model. I hope there are many young people in the audience that do things for society because we have that capability, and the things that we learn uh, can be used uh, in many, many ways. And I, I will give some of my examples of that, but I'm sure that you have many other examples and will hear many examples, because I think that's one of the uh, things that happen to engineers, that they uh, use whatever they know. It could be science, it could be a combination of science and engineering, it could be world issues, or whatever. Uh, and then, then they do something that matters to people. So I would say that that is an important thing. I learned that in an early age, uh, luckily for me, because I had no choice. I had to move on. And uh, uh, Rosalind was the, one of the people that helped me in this early uh, time. And what she told me, is that as a young person going to college, you should learn as much as you can in all fields that you're exposed to. And I did what I could in that direction. So I had basically uh, the simple requirements at uh, uh, a teaching college of, of, of physics, chemistry, and math. So uh, in some order. And uh, they turned out to be really valuable in anything I, I went into later life. But also, listening to what people had to say, I think, was very important as I went along. And I'll just tell you more about this. So um, I graduated from Hunter College uh, in 1951, although that's a very long time, probably before almost all of you were born. Uh, and uh, uh, at that point, um, I, I went abroad. And uh, so how did that all uh, uh, come about? Well, I was walking in the hall, and when you walk in the hall, you, you notice the, the ads. So there was an ad about the Fulbright program. I didn't know what the Fulbright program was, but I knew there was a Senator Fulbright so I read what he had to say in the program. And this was a new, just starting program. Of course, you know about Fulbright Fellowships now, but I was in the first year of that program. So I didn't know anything about it. And probably other people that had actually won Fulbright Fellowships knew about it. But it was an opportunity to study abroad. Well, for me, I had never been outside of New York City beyond what you could reach with a bicycle. So, and this is always a borrowed bicycle. I never owned a bicycle at that time. So it wasn't very often that I got very far. And the idea of traveling abroad was absolutely fantastic to me, it seemed. And uh, so I wound up abroad. And so you can uh, ask me what I learned about being on my own uh, in the first time uh, in another country. Well, I did speak English. Uh, that was uh, useful because I, I chose to go to Cambridge. And uh, I was admitted to a, a women's college because uh, uh, female and male students uh, were not educated at the, in the same colleges. You learn most of the, um, uh, most of the college education was done in the college system, and uh, the students had individual tutorials uh, several times a week, and uh, then they had lectures that you could attend, and you could choose pretty much the lectures that you would attend. Uh, but the a final thing that happened was at the end of the year you had an examination, they were called tripos examinations, and they were very uh, broad in general, and you had to actually know something to pass these exams. 
Uh, uh, but they weren't uh, connected with any particular course. They were just kind of general. And in a sense, that, that's a good way to think about a career because you have to put many things together. And in the previous talks, you heard about putting many things together, uh, including engineering, science, and, and society. So uh, I listened to whatever I thought was interesting. I had uh, supervisions, that is, uh, tutorials every week in uh, various fields. I had math. I had physics, I had chemistry. I didn't have any engineering at that time. Engineering wasn't really so uh, uh, specific, and it wasn't one of the big things at Cambridge at that time. It got more important later on, but I would say that I wasn't uh, uh, too much introduced to it uh, until a little bit later, which I'm going to tell you uh, subsequently. So I'm, I'm in, in the 1950s still, uh, getting my education, so uh, I came back from uh, a year, a year as a Fulbright Scholar, and then uh, thought that Harvard University would be a good place, and, uh, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do there, but you have to declare where, you, in the U.S., you had to declare where you were going and what you wanted to study, so uh, I was doing physics that year. And uh, uh, starting pretty much from the beginning, because I didn't have a, a solid background. And, uh, but I learned this, this is, was a good thing for me, and I decided to pursue that some more. And the next uh, uh, year, I started more uh, serious study. I, I got to the point of a master's degree at, at Harvard, but I would say my knowledge base was, was too little to go on to do anything else. And I, I realized that. It was good that I, I realized where I was and how little I knew. Uh, it's always good to be able to assess where you are and where you ought to be. So uh, uh, I chose a place where I thought I could learn a lot. And, uh, uh, we're, and also that had some freedom to accept uh, strange students that didn't fit into anything, any particular mode. Uh, and, that, and University of Chicago was exactly that. It was also advertised as the very best uh, graduate program in the country in the sciences at that time. So I went there, uh, and uh, my first year, I, I had a, a tremendously influential mentor, Enrico Fermi. Uh, and I, I got to know him mostly by walking down the street, and uh, we were walking to class together. And uh, in my uh, class at, at University of Chicago with Enrico Fermi, there were um, a very small number of students, uh, maybe uh, uh, 20 or 25. Uh, and this is the biggest program in the U.S. at that time. You can imagine, it really wasn't much. And, uh, but but the, uh, the lectures were fantastic. And he would come in uh, and maybe have a piece of paper in front of him. Everything was handwritten. Everything was written on the blackboard. There, there was, uh, uh, and uh, the rule was, uh, no notes were to be taken by the students. He wanted everybody to listen to what he had to say. So he gave you, when you entered the class, handwritten notes. And those, I think, have historical value for anybody that, that has them. I didn't keep my not knowing and thinking that they would be evaluated. <laughs> Uh, but I do remember them, and there were a few students that did keep them, uh, so that you can find them in some memoirs somewhere, and uh, libraries and, and, and uh, museums. So uh, uh, that was, uh, so what did I learn about Enrico, from Enrico Fermi, because he's a famous person, as most of you know. I think he was, uh, I would say, among the top five uh, 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 people in science, all sciences, in in the uh, uh, that that decade, 1950s, and what I learned from him is the importance of having some knowledge base in every subfield of the field that you're going into. So, if you are going into electrical engineering, for example, it's the subject of our discussion here. There are many subfields 
of electrical engineering that you should know something about. Maybe not be experts, but know something about. And I think that the educational program uh, will help you get there. Um, in 1973, that goes back, uh, goes forward a bit from uh, my contact with Enrico Fermi. Uh, uh, computer science came on the table, and I was in a very interesting point uh, that I'll go on in a moment because I'm still in, uh, in, in school in the 1950s uh, uh, to say how I got into that. So, um, Enrico Fermi taught me knowledge base was important, communication skills were important, and uh, <laughs> talking to people. People uh, are valuable in teaching you uh, what you have to know, but you need some time for yourself also to absorb everything and know what, how you're going to be part of the future and contribute. So I would say that's some, a, a message that I could give you because in teaching and doing research and running programs, I believe that that's important. So uh, you, that sort of tells you a lot about uh, the University of uh, uh, Chicago. I did my thesis in superconductivity. The rule at Chicago at that time was you had to think of your own problem, find your own resources to do it, uh, carry it out by yourself. You could ask people for this and that, but it is your thing and uh, you were in charge of your own education. It's a bit different today. Uh, I think the advisors are much more influential in teaching you. The classroom is more important, but it was, you were examined on what you knew and how you put the whole thing together. And that's a bit different from what we do today. But I think careers are, are like this. In careers, you do have to put all this all of this together. So I had some benefit in that uh, uh, way. Also, in the 1950s, I got married, and that meant that I had family responsibilities. And so, uh, and, and my first child was born in 1959. So that was one year after I finished uh, uh, my, my PhD. So I, I was on a different track. So now, I was, when I graduated, I was going to fi find uh, a job somewhere, hopefully, and do something. That was difficult. I had an NSF uh, postdoc for two years, and they paid, paid me, paid my salary anyway, uh, to, uh, to study somewhere. And it was, wasn't all that specific. I could go anywhere. So I followed my husband to Cornell, and uh, uh, that's uh, where I started my career. I would say my uh, career at Cornell for two years was very, very disappointing because what they told me is that there's really no, no place for women in, in, in physics or in you know, the physical sciences and the things I like best. And um, uh, they pretty much told me to get lost. But I wasn't about to do that. Uh, and uh, I was trying to find my way on what I could do. And uh, as a result of two years of kind of disappointment, except for a husband and, and starting a family, uh, I, w I was really nowhere in, in uh, working toward the future. I would say the take home message from that is don't get so disappointed. Life doesn't always deal you the right cards, and sometimes you get you find yourself in a position that's very uncomfortable, and it's not what you planned, and not what you really thought would happen to you. Uh, but you have to move on and uh, uh, benefit from uh, a disappointment and failure, because you don't want that to, to follow you all life, all your life. You know? We want to have some success somewhere, sometime. So uh, I, w I went to uh, the, uh, a conference uh, and it had, oh, you know, the, the conferences in, in, uh, that we had national conferences. 
uh, in the U.S. They, they would have maybe 50 people, not, not really that much. Uh, I remember the, uh, that the, um, in New York City, the main uh, uh, meeting of the American Physical Society uh, in the 1940s had about 40 people or 50 people, and that was the whole U.S. A, the whole country. And I don't know that whether IEEE had a, a meeting anywhere, but I don't imagine that was much bigger. So uh, you could fit a whole society in a small classroom. And, and I was in the very back because I was a very young student and didn't know very much, but I wanted to understand what the professionals were doing. And uh, what I learned from this is that you had to know many, many things because every week there was a different subfield that would come up. And sometimes I understood a small amount and sometimes I didn't. I understood less, sometimes more, but I, I understood that you had to understand very much. And, and uh, I think that meeting Enrico Fermi and showing me a pathway of teaching myself, what I didn't know, uh, uh, was very, very valuable. Uh, that was one of the things I learned at, as a graduate student that was most important, is how to teach myself what I would need to know in future um, uh, career and, and working. Uh, it was, this was a particularly important when I had to change fields several times in my career for, for whatever reason. And uh, I don't know how many people that you will hear from today had to completely change what they were doing at different points in their lives. And I'll mention that as I finish my, my talk. Uh, so now I'm uh, into um, the 1960s uh, so when I, I met uh, at a conference, I met a fellow called Ben Lax. And he was about 15 years or so older than me. Um, and uh, he was starting a program in high magnetic fields. And uh, I had done my PhD thesis in studying superconductivity in a high, well, the high magnetic field. That time wasn't very high, but it was uh, the highest field that was available to me at the University of Chicago at that time. And uh, I found that, that work interesting because I could uh, study the motion of electrons first on, at the individual level and then ensembles and I thought electrons might be important. Um, uh, so, but then uh, electrons and superconductors were kind of interesting because they had no resistivity. So, but then when you got to the normal state, they did, and then that gave you the clue of when you had reached the normal state. So I was uh, uh, studying uh, superconductors Connectivity and very thin wires. What was thin wires today wouldn't be thin wires to you because they were at the micron level, but a single micron, well, that was small at that time, but uh, of course it was bulk behavior uh, to us today. But I, I saw some anomalous behavior that wasn't understood for the next 20 years. <laughs> I, at least I, I discovered something that somebody was interested in but since nobody could explain it or even understand the phenomenon very well, it wasn't explained uh, until much later. I couldn't explain it, although I was trying to, uh, but I found some characteristics that were interesting. When I got my first job, uh, I was very uh, it, uh, interesting, curious, and uh, a, a good idea to change fields completely from what I had learned. So my first job at Lincoln Lab, which uh, is in this area, and I've been in this area ever since, because Lincoln Lab led to MIT, and it led to uh, being a faculty member here, and I'm still doing that. So I didn't change jobs exactly, but I changed fields a number of times while I was uh, here and on the faculty. Why well, we have some young students coming in? <laughs> uh, so welcome. Uh, 
So um, um, now I'm uh, going fast forward in my professional career. So uh, um, I'm in, in the 1960s and I was, uh, uh, I arrived at MIT, my magnetic fields were in vogue at that time and I was asked to, to try to do something that I didn't know anything about in high magnetic fields. So, uh, uh, and not superconductivity, which I did know something about and had something to do with magnetic fields, but I was going to do something else. So I was uh, studying carbon. Why did I pick carbon? I picked, it, I picked that topic because it's very low in the periodic table. I thought a really simple material. Uh, but when you got into it, the electronic, uh, what electrons do was not simple, and the electronic structure of, of uh, uh, determining the kinetics, the energy momentum relation, was not simple. Nothing about it was simple. Uh, uh, but that turned out to be really good for me. And the reason it was good is that so many people thought it was, was not simple, including myself, but it, it kept them away from uh, too much from competing with me. So I had pretty much the field to myself. And since it was not supposed to be interesting to people, uh, uh, it, it stayed my, uh, I, I was able to have not too much competition when my young children were born. So I had four children uh, uh, in that period, in the 1960s. And, uh, uh, and it was really a good, thing that uh, I had time for them, I had time to do my, my job uh, as if I wasn't home with children and uh, you know, living a normal life as far as society was concerned and also living a normal life as with regard to my field. Uh, I was brought to MIT by the Dean of Engineering because he felt that engineers had made huge contributions in the, during World War II, and they did so uh, uh, because the people outside of engineering brought many new scientific ideas for them that led to, uh, let's say, the development of electronics for uh, communications. Uh, it led to uh, uh, many things besides electronics. It was uh, uh, the foundation of very much going on in the engineering school, whether it was electrical engineering, mechanical and chemical engineering. So uh, he thought that we should have more science people with degrees in the basic sciences join the departments and work with the students, undergraduate students, uh, to give them a basis for uh, some of the new engineering applications that would take place. I thought that was great insight of, uh, 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 of, of the Dean of, of uh, Engineering at that time. And uh, the a Dean of Science at that time was very much into topics like high energy physics and big machines and uh, not topics that were relevant to closely to, re relevant to society. So uh, uh, it, that, that was how come I wound up in the engineering school because I wanted to do something a little bit more practical than large accelerators. So, uh, and that worked out well for me and it worked out well for my later career and I think that the sciences moved toward what I wanted to do much more than I moved toward the high energy physics field. But I also got into that too, so uh, I'll tell you how, how that, that happened in uh, some strange way. So I was introduced to carbon and that was kind of a, a field that I did for uh, advancing the frontiers of science. And I worked in that field, I'm still working there. As a matter of fact, because the field follows me, it, it's, because it's so complex and it has so many possibilities on one side, being different from other systems. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's simple enough that uh, for many of the uh, layered compounds that have flooded us in the present century, both in science and application, uh, it's very um, uh, much of an opportunity area. Uh, so uh, 
I have been, I've kept up working in this, but every a decade I do something entirely different in that, that field. Um, and I've changed with the times as the needs of the country, et cetera, have, have changed. So in uh, the 1960s, uh, I was working on the very fundamental things of what carbon is about. It occurs in nature in graphite. It occurs in nature in, com in different compounds. But I was mostly interested in the basic unit carbon. And uh, if you peel the, car the graphite, you get single layers. I always dreamt I could do this. But we never succeeded, and, and that was done uh, much later, in, uh, uh, after 2000. But um, in the 1980s, well, well, first the 1970s, we were making individual layers by putting something between the layers and separating individual layers. We got that far. So we could study the layers uh, when it had very strongly interacting or very weakly interacting entities between them. Uh, we could study the effect of the, of the layers that we had modified on the uh, a substance between them. So we could study both the uh, host material and the guest material. <coughs> that was very interesting and I had many uh, a PhD thesis uh, in this area every time with a different idea uh, and uh, it was a very exciting time for me. And, um, uh, but in 1973, I, I got invited to a conference in Europe. Now, going to Europe for a conference was a big deal in the 1970s and uh, uh, I I believe that uh, that was very early airplane travel. There were very few airplanes at that time, and uh, they weren't supposed to be all that safe, but uh, um, that's what we did. And um, at that time, um, I, got, I met in France. That was the very first uh, uh, conference that gathered people in the whole carbon field. You know, now you have daily almost conferences somewhere. But uh, at that time, having a conference once in every uh, three, four years was a big deal. And um, so I went to a, a, a conference on interpolation compounds in 1973. And I met another person that was working in a similar field for me, uh, Hans Peter Böhm in Germany, and, uh, and we start, started, uh, uh, we did something very parallel. So uh, we were both interested in, in, in graphene, which that's what, what's the thing of today, uh, more or the last ten, 10 years, but we didn't know how to make it. Uh, and he actually made it, but he didn't know how to work with it. So we had a nice uh, uh, get together. He's still alive, as far as I know. I've been in touch with him uh, during the year. Um, and, but he's, he can't travel, and I'm still moving around. So, uh, But I'm, I'm not particularly looking him up. Uh, OK, so uh, that was interpolation compounds. And I, I had something in leadership, because this came about, uh, started in, in the 1970s. And uh, I started getting elected to various posts. I joined the IEEE in the beginning of the 1970s. And so that's a long time ago. That's more than 40 years ago. And um, uh, in the um, 1980, just the beginning of 1980, I, I was elected into the presidential line of, of American Physical Society which is the main uh, uh, society in physics. And uh, so I worked my way up and was the president and then pre past president in 1985. Every year you have a different uh, ranking in this um, uh, presidential line, as it's called. And uh, there I met people in all kinds of physics. And that was very interesting. And it gave me a chance to uh, show some leadership uh, I wasn't the first uh, president, female president of APS. I was actually the second one. And uh, uh, 
Well, the first one uh, was in, in not, not my area, and I got to know her. And uh, um, she went back to uh, I, uh, where, she, I think she was from China originally. And I kind of lost track of her later. Um, anyway, um, so uh, president of APS and um, a great deal of, of science during the 1980s. Uh, uh, it was a, a booming time, uh, uh, and I was kind of a central figure then in, in the carbon field. So that was, um, I was traveling around now in the U.S. giving lots of talks, and um, everything was going fine. And then 1990, uh, the, um, I had to switch, uh, change fields, so a big transformation. Uh, the Magnet Lab, where we had been, uh, I had the most students of anybody at the Mas uh, National Magnet Lab, which was located here in Cambridge, right very close to walking distance of, of this room. Uh, it moved to Florida, and I wasn't about to move to Florida. So uh, uh, the Magnet Lab moved, I didn't move, and I changed fields. I, I tried various different forms of, of uh, electrical engineering, actually. I was uh, trying to work with, with Eric Ippen on fast optics, but I found other people were much better at that than me. I, did, I found that, that, I learned a lot about it, but I didn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't a big, I didn't think I would be a big success in that. So uh, I, I went back to doing carbon science and other kinds of materials. And um, I got very much into layered materials at that time, but I did many other things uh, that were not layered materials. Um, and I had a various uh, uh, different leadership uh, positions. I was president of the AAAS. I was treasurer of the National Academy of Sciences. I was doing all kinds of public services, meeting lots of people, and having um, broadening of, of knowledge base and uh, contributions to many things in government and, and so forth, as scientists are asked to do. And that's very, uh, when you have that opportunity, uh, my first uh, inclination to say, me? I don't know anything about this. What am I going to do? But then again, I've had much experience in getting into areas that I knew nothing about. and. You, you sort of do your best, and you find that you can learn rather quickly based on some uh, knowledge of this and some knowledge of that, and then you could even bring something to the field because you know something that other people don't know and turns out maybe to be useful. So uh, I started studying clusters in the early 1980s. They turned out to be pretty important, and now we have a international cluster conference I went to earlier this month. Uh, so there's just so much happening that, and if you know something, you get invited and then you learn some more things. So uh, it's a matter of uh, time allocation. How are you gonna juggle everything in front of you to be effective and uh, also to keep going yourself? So uh, that becomes uh, an issue that, uh, as you develop in your career. So plan ahead uh, to be able to switch fields, to do new things, to serve whatever master you have. Uh, that we I imagine have an international audience here. Uh, uh, doing something for society is, is valuable because you learn what people care about. And uh, I think that's, that's important. Um, when graphing came around, I joined that field too, and then uh, because I knew something about it, but I knew it from a, from a more historical point of view, but I jumped into a piece of it, and um, I've had many students working on that. I had many students working on beyond graphing, so now people ask me, looking to the future, what are we going to do? Uh, when the present revolution changes and we need to have 
uh, to move, move on. Uh, we've gone from uh, macro scale in electrical engineering to smaller and smaller and smaller gate sizes. And uh, people ask what happens after you get to the level of 10 uh, um, nanometers. Uh, uh, in fact, they ask what happens when we get to a single molecule. In the laboratory, people uh, have been uh, thinking about uh, what kind of device you can make with a single molecule. And uh, you can make something, uh, and uh, maybe that's interesting to know you can make something. Because what, what's been happening is that we've been making something as we get smaller, but we also combine something. And we build up many little things, because we've learned about building up many little things when they're similar, and now we're learning how to build up many things that are different, that we don't have in nature. And this allows you to make devices that n you never thought of. And I would say that that's one of the biggest things that, that I expect to happen in the next decade, is to make use of all the things that we know individually and see all the new things that you can make with new properties and unimaginable um, uh, properties that, uh, that will be discovered by some of the young people in the audience. So uh, uh, I would say, uh, looking to the future, uh, science, instead of uh, uh, solving everything that we, that's before us, Every time you have a PhD thesis, let's say, as some unit of solving a problem, at the uh, thesis presentation, when we start asking the, the uh, uh, to be um, a PhD person, uh, uh, what do you think you've accomplished? Uh, what opens up is five new questions for each question that's been answered because you understand many things connected with that topic, but then there are many things connected with them that lead to something else opens up another question. And uh, I think this is a good place to end and ask you for questions myself. Uh, when I was a beginning graduate student, at, uh, now, uh, or beginning student, I went to Cambridge, this is 1951, I heard, a talk by Brian Pappard, he was a very, was a great, very great scientist, a very imaginative person. Uh, but he believed that during World War uh, II, so many advances had been made that there wasn't very much left for the next generation to work on. So he told us that, that the problems are mostly solved, uh, and you're just going to fill in the gaps that we left for you. Well. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hope, I hope to leave you with, with the um, uh, message that uh, yes, a great deal has happened in the last decade, much of it unexpected, some of it, some of it was expected, that we would solve the problem of this and problem that. But uh, I would say that we have more questions now than we uh, started with. And so we have many things for young people to do. And they're not the things maybe that we would have anticipated and written down in our uh, looking forward to the future. I have done those surveys of looking 10 years beyond now, and uh, they're published so uh, you can read them. Uh, and uh, yes, we have many things that did happen. Uh, right, you want me to end, is that, yeah? I didn't get the message with that message, but uh, I will. Uh, I just want to leave you with the, with the idea. There are many things that you can predict. There are many things that you will not predict correctly and will not think about. But that's really what will come from this generation's work. It will lead to other things. So uh, science is an ongoing thing. Engineering is an ongoing thing. And there are many surprises and many things for young people to do looking at the future. So um, as you start your careers, just, just think of this. Learn, learn something about what's happened up till now. Get some tools, that's very important. Uh, and then just uh, be a free spirit. You will be told in your uh, assignments of employment, wherever you go, 
that you should work on this and that, and you should do that because that's expected of you and you always carry out what you uh, are uh, asked to do and what you say you will do. But uh, always leave a little bit of time in your schedule, in your mind. Uh, don't, don't rush yourself so much that you have no time to think because it's this extra day a week. Bell Labs used to have four days a week when you work for them, and one day where you were thinking about crazy ideas. Uh, think about that, that, that day of crazy ideas, because when you look back in history, it was those crazy ideas that uh, uh, are what we're working on now. And uh, it's important to be thinking about the future. Most of the crazy ideas don't, don't work, but those that do uh, change uh, uh, science, they change engineering, and they change the world around us. So let me just end with that and take any questions if there's time for that. got into electrical engineering because of reading about graphing research in high school. Um, and it was kind of something that really I had never thought about before. I kind of wanted to learn more about. Um, my question is that you talked about, you know, this new set of questions that we're sort of tasked with or have the opportunity to tackle. Um, what do you think is the number one hurdle, I guess, that we need to be aware of? Is it what you spoke of, or <coughs> the rigidity, or is it something else? Is, is it what? Is it the rigidity that you just spoke of, or do you think it's something else? <coughs> rigidity of what? Oh, sorry, the, the next obstacle that, the, the biggest obstacle that we face to tackle these new problems. Oh, oh well, uh, the, the biggest uh, uh, limitation well, I, I, I think that, that people aren't, aren't really, uh, they, I would say people are, are so rushed uh, to, uh, and, and they're so busy, 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 that they don't have time to think uh, out of the box. And uh, it's very uh, detrimental to just keep <coughs> focused. You have to keep focused. You have to do what, what you're uh, signed up to do and carry out your your obligation, so to speak, because uh, if, if you don't do what you promise to do, then people won't believe in you, right? So uh, you, you carry out your kind of task uh, as best you know how, but always leave some time to be thinking about what you're doing, why you're doing, what it, how it fits into the bigger picture and what might be uh, what you hear in your ear, you know, that, that may lead to something that you would like to work on next when you finish this project. You undertake a project and it's finished. And you're still working with the same company, the same organization, whatever. Research, you know, university, whatever you're doing, uh, uh, this is just general career uh, advice. Always leave time to think about what might be important. Okay, Silicon Valley was started by entrepreneurs that were thinking of something, and they got some uh, sponsorship to do that, and it's changed many things in electrical engineering, computer science, but also in how we live. It's had a big impact. So you want to be a person that. The, the people here want, uh, we want to be people that have something to do with making, changing the world around them. Okay, something like that. Yeah, I would say, but it's not easy. Yeah, more, there was more questions. Oh, okay. One, one more question. Anyone? Last one question. Yeah, this question. There's a lot of noise outside. Sorry. Um, you mentioned that uh, there were difficulties with solving your own problem and learning on your own, especially um, in graduate life. What are your thoughts on that? Is it always 
really time intensive and like slow or does it get better with experience? Okay. Well, when, uh, I wouldn't say I had problems. Uh, uh, I was unprepared oftentimes when I started uh, at the early level since I didn't come from the right background. And so uh, uh, when you make an application nowadays for uh, the college you want to go to or something like that, let's say, a graduate school uh, uh, position, uh, you don't have the right background. Uh, so you feel um, uh, uh, inadequate. It isn't always the very best prepared people that graduate. So let's take college. Many people in this uh, uh, room, I guess, are students in college. It isn't the students that are the most promising at the beginning uh, who are the most promising at the end. There is a good correlation, or there's some correlation. It's not a zero correlation, but the correlation is not as great as people think because there are very many unlikely people that do are in the top 10%, and they started at the bottom 10%. This happens more infrequently than you would think. And the reason is that they didn't have the exposure and the role of their education was different. It was to give them exposure as well as information and contact with many people that was very important in their development. So you learn many things uh, at, in every position, whether it's education, job, public service. You learn things. Have, keep your mind open uh, what it does for you, for your environment where you're working, and for the future. Always think of those different levels and uh, Sometimes you do something interesting. So thank you, Professor Mildred. Um, so we have our last speaker, Professor Kano, and we're going to help her have been setting up the slides. And he's going to talk about the computer security and the Internet of Things. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers for creating this event. I think it's very it's wonderful and inspiring to bring together a bunch of people uh, who are interested in research, especially at the undergraduate level. Uh, and I think that the fact that you are all here today on a Saturday morning, uh, you know, after a long period of seating and still thinking about research, is kind of a, an indicator of the success that you'll have in your future career. Uh, and you know, I agree with many of the things I heard about the, the other speakers say. Uh, for example, there's a lot of conversation about leadership. I think those are very, very good advice. Uh, and what I suggest for you all is to come back to that advice maybe every year as your place in life changes uh, and kind of revisit those lessons because those lessons will take on new meanings uh, over time. For the purposes of today, I wanted to do two things. One is I wanted to talk about some of the computer security research that we do in our lab at the University of Washington. Uh, I also wanted to give some advice for undergraduates, for, for those of you who are doing research uh, both now and into the future. Uh, I also try to talk a little bit quick, but hopefully not too quick, uh, since I know that uh, people might want to try to pick up the schedule. So moving on to the topic of computer security, uh, I want to begin by briefly talking about my views of the future. In particular, I think that, like many of you, technology can be a great enabler. With technology, we can improve many aspects of our lives. We can improve work productivity, healthcare, education, leisure activities, you name it. With technology and science, we can probably improve it in some way. But the question becomes, are there any potential downsides with this new technology? It turns out that there can be when we throw the, the hacker into the mix. Now, the hacker might be, might be very malicious, or maybe they're just curious, but they have the potential to turn these wonderful new technologies upside down. For example, identity theft has been an issue for a very, very long time. Technology has only made that easier. By the way, this is Carl, a former PhD student in my lab. I'm not sure what he's doing right now. 
So one of the key focuses of our group at the University of Washington is to try to anticipate what are going to be the hot new technologies over the next 5, 10, or 15 years, and what might their security and privacy downsides be. If we can understand what these downsides might be, we can try to proactively address these security and privacy concerns early. And the way I like to say it is we really want to have our cake and eat it too. We want the benefits of these new technologies without the associated security and privacy downsides. I'm going to be talking about three examples for this talk, focusing on the Internet of Things, but then again, this is just a subsample of the projects that we do in our lab. Focusing first on medical devices. Up here you see pictures of two implantable medical devices. These are pacemakers. They're designed to give small shocks to the heart at regular intervals to keep the heart beating correctly. These devices also have short-range wireless communication capabilities. The ones in this figure can communicate for about 10 centimeters or so. One of the questions we have is, what are the security and privacy risks with implantable medical devices? I should say we started this research about a decade ago now, so 2006, 2007 or so. In thinking about these computer security and privacy risks, one of the important things to keep in mind is that these devices are becoming more sophisticated and more communicative. So instead of just 10 centimeters or so, they might communicate for meters range, and again, they have lots of different functionalities. So pacemakers to keep the heart beating correctly. You have neurostimulators for epilepsy or uh, overactive bladders. You also have implantable medical devices being designed to treat things like sexual dysfunction and so on. So a wide variety of capabilities. The approach that we use in our lab to try to understand what the security risks might be with an implantable medical device is to actually obtain one. And that's exactly what I did with my colleagues at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and also the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, which is affiliated with Harvard Medical School here, here in Boston. What we did is we obtained an implantable defibrillator uh, that was introduced into the US market in 2003. So it was a current generation device at the time, though not the latest generation device. And we asked the question, what might we be able to do with our own equipment when interacting with this device? We found that we, we were able to do the following, which means that anyone else could have done this following as well. Uh, we were able to change critical settings on the device. So for example, we could change the patient's name, the prescribing, the prescribing hospital, the diagnosis, and so on. We also found that we could change the therapies on this device. So for example, we could change the amount of voltage that the, the pacemaker would, would, would issue uh, when it was trying to, to keep the heart beating correctly. And we could also found that we could actually force this device to issue a large shock to the heart. Stepping back, even though we found these results of what an unauthorized party might be able to do, I want to stress that I think the benefits of these devices still today far outweigh the risks. So for example, if I had any medical reason to have one of these devices, I'd have no qualms about getting one, including one of the ones that we studied. But I believe that this type of work is important because it helps us understand what the potential issues might be as these devices become more sophisticated and more communicative, and then industry and the government can work on trying to proactively address these issues. And so that is exactly what has happened. Industry has been very focused on trying to understand and improve security for devices, the FDA is, and so on. I want to move on to another example, a wireless children's toys. Some of you might have had some of these toys yourselves. Uh, for, for right or wrong, we're starting to see more and more computation being put into toys. Uh, this was a while ago, Video Girl Barbie has a webcam, or not webcam, but a video camera uh, you know, in her chest. She can take pictures. Um, and we also have wireless children's toys. These are robots uh, on the upper left of your screen. Uh, two of which have wireless communication capabilities and also have webcams. So some of the, and again, some of you might have had these, but one of the ways that they're marketed is that they say, okay, we'll buy this wireless toy, hook it up to your home network, uh, you can drive it around, and when you go to your friend's house, uh, you can connect over the internet to your wireless toy robot, drive it around, and make sure your parents aren't in your room. And so the question we ask is, what are the security and privacy risks with this toy robot? Uh, we found that just as like it was easy for the user to connect to their toy robot in their home, it was actually pretty easy for anyone else, you know, a neighbor or anyone else on the internet to also connect to these, these particular devices, uh, drive them around and view what's happening in the bedroom and so on. A number of takeaways from this particular avenue of research, 
Uh, the first was that it was actually pretty easy for us to accomplish these capabilities. Uh, and then what, what that means is that security, computer security and privacy was not on the forefront of the minds uh, of these developers when they were creating these technologies. And so kind of as an aside, one of the things that I would really like to see is when people are creating more and more Internet of Things technologies to proactively be considering computer security and privacy. Uh, let me turn to my third example, the modern automobile. Uh, modern automobile is becoming pervasively computerized, just like many other aspects of our lives. Uh, and there's many, many reasons for this, one of which is safety. Uh, so for example, you might have a wheel, you might have a sensor attached to each of your wheels that is detecting how fast each wheel is spinning. Those sensor readings are being sent over the car's internal computer network uh, to another computer on the car. And that other computer is determining whether one wheel is spinning faster than the other. If it detects that one wheel is spinning faster than the other, it's an indication that you're entering into a skid. The traction control system might have enabled and would send a message to the brake computer saying, brake computer, please slow down the back right wheel. So huge safety implications for an increasing computerization and the interconnectivity of those computers in the car. But as before, we asked the question, are there computer security and privacy risks with the increasing computerization of the modern automobile? We asked this question in two phases. The first phase of our research asks, what might an adversary be able to do if they could connect to the car's internal computer network? Uh, by the way, if you've been paying attention to the news over the summer, you've probably heard a lot about car security. Uh, we did our work in 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, and so our papers have been online for about ten, five years or so. Uh, but we've been very uh, kind of not talking about it too broadly because we wanted to work with government and industry without creating too much uh, sensation around this. But the first question we asked is, what might an adversary be able to do if they were to connect to the car's internal computer network? It turns out that for every modern, every modern car purchased in the U.S., there's a federally mandated diagnostics port underneath the dash. And when you bring your car in for service, the technician will plug into that diagnostics port and from that be able to figure out what might be wrong with your car. And so for the first phase of our research, we say, what might an adversary be able to do if the adversary connects to the car's diagnostics port under the dash? That's a big if, you know, how likely is it for an adversary to connect his, own, his or her own hardware? But we ask, what might an adversary do? How do you go about answering this question? Well, we did it by buying two 2009 edition modern sedans. Uh, we kept one at the University of Washington and the other at UC San Diego, the collaborators on this project. This is a photo of our experimental setup. Uh, as you can see, there's a laptop and then there's some connect connector cables connecting to the OBD2 or the onboard diagnostics 2 port underneath the dash. Uh, using this setup, we found that we could exercise pretty much arbitrary control over the vehicle. Uh, so, for example, here we have set the, speed limit, the speedometer to going 140 miles an hour. The car is in park. We also added a little banner advertisement. You know, we could have said buy, you know, your favorite, you know, you know whatever your phishing email you get. Uh, but we found that we can control the, the, the dashboard. We can control the vehicle's lighting, uh, turn on or off all the lights within the car. So, for example, even at night, we can turn off the headlights, we can turn off the taillights, we can turn off the brake, the lights that light up the, the, what you see on the dash. We can control the engine, the transmission, the passenger comfort system, and the brakes. Since a picture is often uh, worth a thousand words, I wanted to give you a little video of uh, some of the capabilities that we have created. And again, this is around 2009, 2010 or so. Uh, in this video, you'll see one PhD student, Alexei Cheskis, driving down a decommissioned airport runway. Uh, the other PhD student, Carl Kosher, has his laptop connected to the diagnostics port underneath the dash. Uh, and when Alexei hits a certain speed, he's going to be talking on the radio because we're documenting all this and so on. When Alexei hits a certain speed, Carl's going to press a button on his keyboard that will send a message over the car's internal computer network that says to apply the brakes. Two, one, zero. Nine. So again, Alexei is talking. He starts to accelerate. Hit the brakes at three, two, one, zero, now. Okay, Carl press the button. Uh, and the brakes are applied. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, Alexei had a lot of fun with those experiments. 
Uh, one of the things that we also found, again, the increasing computerization in the automobile has enormous value for safety. So one of these things is anti-lock braking. And how does anti-lock brake work? Well, someone is you know, driving on ice, they slam on the brake pedal, but really they should be pumping the brake pedal. What that means is that the computer that controls the brake has the ability to override the brake press and release the brake pressure temporarily. What we found that we were able to do is an adversary connected to the car's internal computer network can disengage the brake. Let me show you that here. So Lexi's going to start driving. Uh, Carl's going to press the button to disengage the brake. You can hear Lexi pressing on the brake, uh, but you can't stop. Accelerating a little bit. You can see the end of the runway right there. And so in our car, uh, the parking brake was under mechanical control, so at 20 miles an hour, he was able to stop the car with the parking brake. Uh, other cars have uh, the parking brake under electronic control. So at this point, you might say, okay, well, that's quite interesting, but you know, what's the likelihood of an adversary connecting their own hardware underneath the dash? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we might start brainstorming ways where this might apply. For example, uh, you know, the mechanics or the valet or so on. But really, more interesting question is what might an adver how might an adversary get the ability to connect to the car's internal computer network without ever physically touching the car? Uh, we found a number of ways to do this. Uh, so, for example, our car has a CD player. Our CD player is connected to the car's internal computer network. What we did is we wrote a program, or more accurately, Carl wrote a program that takes any MP3 file and outputs a Windows Media Audio file, WMA file, plays perfectly fine on my, and burn it, you can burn it to a CD, plays perfectly fine on a Windows laptop, perfectly fine on a Mac. Uh, our demo CD played Beethoven's Ninth. Uh, you plug that Beethoven's Ninth CD into the car's CD player, our demo CD unlocks the doors, but we could have done anything else we wanted as well. But here's another example. Our car has a built-in telematics unit. What is that? Think about OnStar or BMW Connected Drive or Ford Sync. Our car has the ability to call 911 when it gets in an accident. What that means is that our car has a built-in cell phone. And what that means is that an adversary can also call that car's phone number. So what did we do? Uh, through a lot of reverse engineering, we found the ability to call our car's phone number well, if I once we have the phone number, you can war dial for that if you're familiar with the term. We can call our car's phone number, play the appropriate tone to switch to the in-band modem. Then there was an authentication vulnerability, so we played the appropriate tones to bypass that authentication vulnerability. Now we're authenticated with the car's internal computer network. Now there was a buffer overflow vulnerability, so we play some more modem tones, exploit the buffer overflow vulnerability, and get our own code running on the car. Our car's telematics unit has a, base, a QNX, so basically a variant of Unix. We bought the car from the dealership. Our telematics unit came with a bunch of Unix tools already installed, such as FTP. And so what we do, and since our car is a built-in cell phone, it has 3G data, with that little bit of code that we put on the car, we just make it basically open up an FTP connection to uh, the service at the University of Washington and download some more code. What do we end up doing? We ended up downloading uh, an IRC client. Our car will then connect to our IRC uh, server at the University of Washington, and our car is part of our, our botnet. Uh, so we have our own code running on the car. So one, what can we do with this capability? We want to understand the potential impacts and risks of this. And so we explored several scenarios. Uh, the first scenario I'm going to describe is an end-to-end -end theft scenario. So after we compromise the car, uh, if someone had a financial motive, what we can get is that we can get the car to send us, via our servers at UW, uh, the GPS coordinates of the car. Uh, and then we can also do things like we can, uh, well, now we know where the car is, we can remotely over the internet uh, unlock the car doors, start the car engine, uh, you know, disable the shift lock solenoid so that you can shift out of park, and so on. So this is uh, Francie Rosner, she's actually a professor at UW. Uh, she co-runs the security and privacy lab with us there. Uh, and she's going to describe how to steal a car over the internet. 
So we've already compromised the car via the exploit. So it's on the IRC channel. Uh, we've already compromised the car over the internet. Uh, we run the theft program. And then it's just a simple matter of executing the theft program. You'll hear the car start. And then the car can just drag the car away with that key. Uh, and here comes Carl. <laughs> Uh, the car doors are locked, by the way. Uh, we locked them. Uh, you'll notice there's no key in the ignition, but it's kind of a little bit shaky. Sorry. Oh, buckle up like any good car thief. Don't forget that part. No key in the ignition. You can shift out of park uh, and then just start driving away. The only thing that we couldn't do over the internet was break the steering column lock, uh, but, there, but there's YouTube videos on how to do that in 15 seconds. Uh, we didn't want to do that because uh, to our car, because we had a lot more experiments to run. Uh, as another example of our results, uh, it turns out that our car has Bluetooth hands-free calling. What does that mean? It means that there are microphones inside the cabin. Well, what does that mean? It means that we can remotely, again, over the internet, after we've compromised the car, turn on those in-cabin microphones and listen in on everything that's happening inside the vehicle uh, without any visual indicators inside the car. So, uh, actually, let me back up a little bit. Uh, in this particular scenario, uh, Alexi and Carl will be driving the UW car, and our collaborators at UC San Diego, in particular Steve Checkaway, has now compromised the UW car over the internet and is going to eavesdrop on their communications. Uh, the students, by the way, came up with a skit on their own. It goes Alexi and Carl, they're entering the car. Again, <laughs> having a private conversation. Gene Bowser's going to be super excited that we finally kidnapped Yoshi. Um, and then meanwhile, Steve uh, is in his office. And this is the audio that's gonna be, that is recorded in Steve's audio, office. So it's this high quality. Our car is also broadcasting his GPS coordinates over the internet connection that we've, that we've compromised. So audio will start pretty soon. I think right about now. <laughs> King Bowser's gonna be super excited that we finally kidnapped Yoshi. Okay, so uh, stepping back, uh, you know, these are just three of the sample projects that we've done at the University of Washington. I picked them because I think they're kind of more visual, uh, more engaging than some of the other stuff that we do. Our ultimate goal is to try to figure out how can we improve the security of future technologies so that we can achieve the, the wonderful benefits that these new technologies might bring uh, without the associated security and privacy downsides. For the three projects that I discussed, our process was to experimentally, to obtain real examples of those artifacts, experimentally analyze them, try to understand what their issues might be, and then try to think about like, well, what are the recommendations we might give for the community? What are the new security innovations and new security techniques do we need in this context to help create more secure, more secure systems? An automotive example, uh, it did have a bunch of industry impact. The Society of Automotive Engineers created a task force focused on cybersecurity. Uh, in response to our work, DARPA created a $60 million project uh, called Hackems focused on how do you create more secure automobiles. A lot of research needs to be done there. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, uh, they developed a cybersecurity testing laboratory, and there's been significant hiring within the industry. Uh, one of these articles from General Motors quoted an order of magnitude of hiring in security because of these types of issues. And again, uh, these results are about five years ago. Uh, there's a lot more results that are coming out this summer, and industry is really take, uh, pay, taking attention. Uh, some other takeaways from this work is that computers are becoming pervasive in the technologies in our environment. Uh, one of the things that I suggest that you do, if you're interested in security, is that as you walk around, see where all the computers might be in your environment. And then, in addition to asking the normal question of, ooh, that's a cool computer, how could I use it? Ask the question, huh, I wonder how someone else might misuse it. Now, don't you misuse it yourself, but ask that question, and then you start thinking about what the security and privacy issues might be. Uh, and of course, research plays a critical role in understanding both the risks and opportunities for improving the future. Uh, there are other types of work that we do at UW. Uh, one of the things that we do is try to measure properties of the real world. Uh, in particular, we try to understand like what 
you know, what are adversaries doing today? What are the privacy risks today with, for example, online web tracking? I've done a lot of work on web tracking. Uh, one project that I thought I'd mention because, you know, I know people like um, movies and songs uh, is that, you know, if, I, don't want, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but how many people have ever shared a movie over BitTorrent? Bit, bit, BitTorrent. You know, so lots of people, lots of people have done that. Uh, some people might have received DMCA takedown notices. You know, basically saying, you know, we, you know, the RIAA or the MPAA have caught you sharing content illegally. One of the things that we wanted to know was, were the MPAA and RIAA using basically due diligence to understand if someone was actually illegally sharing content? So we looked at the BitTorrent network. Uh, we understood how it worked, and then we said, hey, you know. I, we don't think that they're actually doing a good job of figuring out if someone's really sharing that content. And so what we did is we started incriminating other devices within our network. Uh, we started, and you know, as an example of this, uh, we had an IP printer, you know, a printer connected to the network, and we decided to incriminate it of sharing Iron Man 3, uh, and then our printer got a DMC takedown notice. Uh, just kind of an example of uh, kind of you know, our understanding of the rigor that they, that they were using to evaluate this. And of course, we try to build more secure systems as well. I'm going to move on to a thanks slide. This is not the end of my talk, but, a, it, but the end of the first part of the talk, talking about security. Uh, as we've heard from a number of other speakers say, really, it's about people. Uh, and while I'm the person up here giving this talk, I think it's very important to realize there are a large number of people, including both undergraduate and graduate students, that made this work successful. This is the current membership of, our, of the Security and Privacy Lab at the University of Washington. As I mentioned, Francie and I are the, are the two faculty involved. Uh, we have a number of students, uh, some of whom, you know, Security and Privacy Lab, so obviously they don't have a photo. Uh, <laughs> and a large number of alumni as well. Uh, a number of them went on to faculty positions at other universities. Uh, and Alicia, who I see sitting up there, uh, worked with our lab as, and, and published a paper in it uh, when she was in high school. You know, here is, you know, up to the upper left, Anna's giving a talk at one of our seminars. Uh, Francie's in the middle of walking around doing some research with a kind of very simple augmented reality type device. They're hanging out in the lab. We have a lab soccer team. Uh, Paul was recently down at CSI Cyber uh, doing some, running a demo for them, which will appear in the show soon. Uh, I'm not sure I can talk about the details of that demo, but that's Paul at CSI Cyber. Uh, and on the bottom right, uh, us trying to break out of a puzzle room, if you've heard of such a thing, they're quite fun. So some general advice, kind of building on the, some of the things that you've seen in those, those slides that I mentioned. One of the biggest advice that I have to give is that do what you love. You know, find something that you're passionate about and do that. Uh, there's a Japanese expression that translates into, if you like it, you are good at it, or since you like it, you are good at it. Um, so I really, really, rather than say, okay, I want to be that type of person, I highly suggest you to find, hey, this is fun, I want to do it, uh, and that will drive things. Uh, if something sounds interesting to you and you want to get involved, just ask. Uh, you know, it never hurts to ask, uh, and if you send some message to a faculty, often, oftentimes including a resume and a transcript can help with that. Uh, expect to be challenged and work hard. Uh, research is not easy, and one of the things that I think many of us love about research is that we start tackling questions that we don't really know the answers to at the very beginning. But it's oftentimes easy to pick a project that is just too hard. Uh, and so you don't want something that's infeasible. So you know, obviously work with your advisors to figure out something that is tractable that you can make progress on that will push you and challenge you uh, while at the same time not uh, just becoming a roadblock. Uh, and strive for a balance. Uh, you know, I like to say that research is a marathon and not a race. Uh, and if you enter research, maybe you'll have a doing it for 50, 60 years. Uh, and so kind of keeping that in mind. And again, continue to have fun. Uh, as an undergraduate, one of my big advice is to not pick an air, uh, is not, not to worry too much about whether this is the area that you want to be in for the rest of your life. Uh, and in fact, as a previous speaker mentioned, she changed areas, you know, every 10 years. I've also definitely changed areas before too. I started as a cryptographer, now I'm doing computer security. Uh, and you know, actually for a while there I was doing computational biology. So have fun, again, don't worry too much about if this is the area that you want to be in for the rest of your life. I firmly believe that finding a good advisor match is probably one of the most important things. So more than, for example, you know, is this you know, the right area, uh, but is this someone that you can be working with? 
uh, kind of consistent with some of the other things that we've heard this morning, college is really an opportunity to diversify. Uh, there's definitely time later in your career to specialize very deeply, but try to take as much time to learn about things that you might not have an opportunity later to learn about. Uh, you know, the liberal arts, history, uh, sociology, literature, uh, and so on. Uh, and kind of in the similar thing, learn both about your area and other areas. Uh, this is a great venue for doing that. As we've heard earlier today, you'll be learning about environmental issues, uh, you'll be learning about uh, you know, a variety of different things, you know, the human aspect of it, and learning about all those things, I think, can only make you, uh, your career richer and more strong. And again, have fun and stay curious. So with that, uh, I thought I wanted to close. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions, either now uh, or if we're out of time uh, later. You can always find me. It turns out that Yoshi is not a super common name, except if you play Nintendo. Uh, but if you search Yoshi University of Washington, you'll, you can find me. Uh, and of course, there's a security and privacy lab at UW. So that, uh, that's it for my remarks. I know we are running out of time, but maybe we can have a couple of questions. Yep. Um, if, you ever, if you were able to find the results of like hacking cars like so long ago, did industry like not really kind of take that to heart? Because we had the whole Chrysler Jeep thing over the summer, yep. which was that exact same kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's a very good question. So if you didn't hear it, the question is, you know, since we did our work on cars in 2009, 2010, uh, you know, why is it that we are still finding vulnerabilities in vehicles? Uh, there's several answers to that. One is that some parts of industry definitely paid attention. Uh, and so after we did the results in 2009, 2010, uh, you know, we were invited to give talks at a bunch of automotive manufacturers. We saw significant hiring increases at some of them, for example, General Motors. Uh, you know, uh, we talked abroad, internationally as well, you know, the automotive manufacturers in Germany and Japan. Security is still very hard, and not everyone listens the same way. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, we'll continue to see these types of issues. Um, you know, you think about also for like, uh, another example I'll mention is that computer security for the automobiles, especially five years ago, was very much like desktop security in the mid-1990s, in the sense that in the mid-1990s, you had computers that were not really, you know, like Windows 95, not really designed to be connected to the internet. Then dial-up modems came, adversaries started to appear, and Microsoft really had to just step back and completely revisit how do we do security. The state of the art of security for the modern automobile is very similar in the sense that they haven't not received the adversarial pressure yet. Uh, and maybe just one example, if you're, if for those of you in computer science uh, and you've heard of things like buffer overflow vulnerabilities and stir copy, this is something that you know, Windows learned not to do in the mid-1990s. The vulnerabilities we found for the modern automobile were exactly straight up stir copy vulnerabilities. We just extracted the source, the exacted, extracted the software, searched for stir copy, found the first location of stir copy, and that was exploitable. Okay, yep. Yeah, uh, I don't know how much time uh, we have. Just one more. Okay, because we're really seriously running out of time, so one last one. I'm sure Professor yeah, I can still be around, yeah. right? So you can see him. Uh, so one more. Um, quick one. So given the Given the amount of legacy systems that are around and will continue to be around in the coming years, um, how do you see um, the effort distributed in terms of attacking problems in, in systems that are being developed right now versus retrofitting systems that are currently existing to make them more watertight? Yeah, well, that's a very, very good question. So the question was about uh, the fact that there's so many legacy systems out there. Uh, that's a that is a very, very hard problem. Uh, there are some researchers, including our, myself, who are trying to figure out what are ways to kind of put shim layers around existing systems that make them more secure. Um, obviously, we want to make future systems also secure. Uh, but we run into lots of questions like, how do you do secure software update? And maybe one thing I'll just mention and leave you with this notion is zombies. What is a zombie? Uh, a zombie is an IoT device, for example, a refrigerator that might live for 30 years in your house but has a two-year manufacturer warranty and after two years stops being, ma being maintained. And so today, you know, I might get a new computer every few years and just the old one kind of just gets recycled. If I have appliances that have com computational capability and that I keep in my house for 30 years, what, but they stop being maintained by the manufacturer, the term is they become a zombie, what do we do about that? All right, All right thank you, Professor Yoshi. Thank you. Thank you.